all those present here in person also on online and conveners rutpik sangvi mahesh naik welcome to this lecture meeting on pillar 2 overview before i give you a little background let me with great happiness announce that bcs has invested a great deal of time and money on making the technology work so that this meetings can be arranged in a hybrid mode and this is a second hybrid mode meeting we are still in the implementation stage so my apologies in advance if there is a slight technical snag and it hampers the meeting for certain time but yes we would continue and with your blessings and best wishes we would definitely be up and running in very short time so we look forward to a great future let me come to the introduction of the topic the international tax world has changed significantly in the last few years first we had the oecd mli mli coming into effect to tackle tax avoidance structures now the discussion is moving from tax avoidance to minimum tax the focus is on not allowing a zero tax policy which in some sense may sound a death knell for tax havens across the world the inclusive framework on beps of which india is an active member has formulated a two pillar solution to address the tax challenges in a digitized economy as well as ensuring minimum tax of the two pillars pillar 2 provides for minimum tax and has been formulated to discourage a race to the bottom in terms of tax rates by various countries especially tax havens pillar 2 achieves this by introducing minimum global corporate tax which consists of an in income inclusion rule that is iir and undertaxed payment rule that is utpr together called the global anti base erosion shortly globe rules if these were these terms were not enough i have been told that there is also a subject to tax rule well why should one study all these new terms the reason is that the pillar 2 will have a large impact around the world forcing changes in the tax laws of tax havens we have already seen the impact of pillar 2 with uae announcing applicability of corporate tax from next year a notion that was unthinkable just a couple of years back this is the reason why pillar 2 which may have a much larger impact on very large amni groups that is about a consolidated group turnover of euro 750 million will bring in changes across the tax world it is hence very important to understand the nuances of the pillar 2 rules as they would require amendments to the domestic tax laws as well the inclusive framework has recently released the model globe rules as well as the commentary to such rules along with illustrative examples this is the reason why it was considered this is the right time to educate our members on these latest development from an expert none other than geeta benjani on the subject those who are familiar with bcs knows what bcs stands for but it is possible that there are many online participants who may be a new member or who may not be the members of the bcs community 
Let me very briefly tell you what BCS is all about. Well, it's one of the oldest voluntary body of chartered accountants with 73 years of rock solid history. It was established just six days after the ICI and has more than 8,000 members. Its knowledge dissemination averages about 250,000 man hours every year. Its publication with contribution by volunteers who are experts in the field have been much in demand. The journal BCAJ is published every month by BCS and is one of the most well-respected publication widely read across different sections of industry, government, and chartered accountants. BCS has over the years, through its knowledge dissemination, dedicated efforts of the volunteers and network <clears throat> networking platform has been responsible in creating several domain experts and leaders. It has presence on all prominent social media and has substantial following there. I urge you to reap maximum benefits through participation in several activities of the BCS. If you are not a member, I strongly recommend that you become a member because this is one institution which I have realized with experience and over a period of time that gives you much more in return than what you give it to them. Visit, if you want to have some further details, the BCS website at www.bcsonline.org to have full view of these activities. I wish you all great learning and wish a great success in your future endeavor by putting this knowledge gained in practice. With this, may I request convener Rutwik Sangvi to introduce the speaker. Thank you, President-elect. Uh, good evening, friends. I have the pleasant uh, opportunity to uh, introduce one of my favorite, personal favorite speakers, uh, a wealth of knowledge which, you know, kept with oneself uh, may be good, but a wealth of knowledge when shared, it always multiplies. And therefore, we have that enshrined in the form of Gita Ben Jani. Uh, Gita Ben always is forthright and always is uh, you know, available for the society at every occasion. And today we have a lecture meeting, which is obviously held with all of you present. But what happens behind the scenes is what, you know, we as conveners and Mayur Bhai as the chairman would acknowledge is that uh, they are always available for every planning of a course, every opportunity where they can contribute either to the society's programs or to the journal. And that is where may not come out so easily, which I thought, let me acknowledge today before I introduce formally, uh, you know, Gita ma'am today to the audience. Uh, Gita ma'am is a partner in the Ernst & Young's Tax Knowledge and Solutions Group, the KNS Group, uh, as it's popularly known. It's a dedicated team of tax professionals that provides technical support to the tax practice and is engaged in developing tax strategies. Uh, Gita ma'am is a fellow member of the ICAI and has uh, the distinct honor of securing the first rank in the two principal exams of institute. And she has a distinction of also being the first lady to having achieved this. So if there was any doubt about whether, you know, today's topic we had considered her as a proper speaker or not, she's also secured the highest rank in the income tax paper of the Institute's final examination and which probably most of us here may not be able to clear today. So uh, Gita Ma'am has also contributed papers and made presentations at different forums on subjects of direct and international taxation. And before joining ENY India, uh, Gita Ma'am was a partner in PD Desa and Company, uh, a home of uh, illustrious professionals, including uh, Pinakin Sir, who have always been very, very forthcoming also. Uh, Gita Ma'am was also visiting professor in, in Narsi Monji College of Commerce and Economics, a leading college in Mumbai. And today, uh, today's topic we had discussed maybe briefly and just in the same instance when we, when we sought her time, she immediately agreed that she would come down and give this uh, talk to us. 
and we could not have had a better speaker today for you know discussing or for understanding this topic so it would probably not be off topic to say that uh, for the society uh, geeta ma'am is also equally a pillar and therefore she acts therefore it's a privilege for us to listen to her so without further ado ma'am it's floor is your uh, sorry before we start the process yeah let me have a pleasure of uh, asking chairman of the international tax committee mayur nayak to hand over a memento to the speaker as a token of our love and appreciation thank you very much thank you all yours respected uh, seniors president elect past presidents friends present here and uh, friends connected uh, through technology uh, welcome you all i think uh, we had a very nice introduction from president elect as to what uh, we are going to talk about so yes very true that uh, we had beps 1 and it's like when you start with something where you test the success you need to have another series of it so it's bahubali 1 then you have bahubali 2 then you have branching and sub branching coming from it so 2008 lehman brothers collapse and need for garnering the resources a realization which perhaps uh, was uh, vociferously advocated by developing countries that look century old pe rules need to be abandoned but there was a strong resistance ultimately they said okay let's discuss about digitalized economy it started with the concept of addressing tax issues emerging from newer business models little did they realize that you know digitalized taxation or digitalized business taxation was one small piece of the overall spectrum they realized that treaty shopping transfer pricing rules needed revamp so it was there that we had 15 action plan points which came as part of beps 1 and we all know it had mli 1 ppt which came in cbcr which came in and transfer pricing rules got strengthened beps 1 which started with prime motive of addressing taxation issues of digitalized business they couldn't come to a consensus on that so it was like you started the project with a view to address something but you couldn't come to a consensus so it spilled over to beps 2 and as the discussions went further there was a further realization that you have issue of beps that is base erosion and profit shifting apart from reallocating taxing rights abandoning pe concept and maybe revamping arms length principle or abandoning arms length principle you also need to address the issue about presence of tax havens or the countries which are popularly called noon countries no or only nominal tax countries so the realization was that any measure you take it will not be effectively achieving targeting tax avoidance or aggressive tax planning unless you are able to eliminate those nations which are into the competition of race to bottom that you make them pay minimum tax so that's where beps 2 came in it branched out into two pillars pillar 1 being having revised profit allocation 
and allocating taxing rights to market jurisdictions. Again, so pillar one, abundance PE concept. Pillar one, also abundance arms length principle concept because it is talking about global formulary apportionment. Pillar one is not the agenda for our discussion. Pillar two is to achieve minimum taxation anywhere in the world. Now, this is very, very important. And as President-elect mentioned, that what was unthinkable that UAE will come up with tax provisions or will introduce taxation in their country is only because as a global community, on account of political will and commitment, everybody has agreed that there will be minimum tax at the rate of 15 percentage. So pillar two again has two sub branches that is subject to tax rule and minimum taxation. We will focus on minimum taxation that is globe rules about which there was a mention. We'll get into the philosophy. We will get into certain aspects of it. We will also see that, you know, whether India is a safe haven. So our idea today is we all know that it applies to MNEs. But is it that if we do not have MNE headquartered entity as our client, we don't need to worry? Are we by any chance going to audit accounts of an entity which may be a part of MNE group? Are we likely to get involved into due diligence which might require us to verify whether what has been done in the accounts in terms of tax provisioning is the right thing? Now, if answer to any of this question is yes, it may not be correct to believe that pillar two is not going to touch us. Those which are MNE groups, that is large groups, which are within CBCR limit, which have aggregate turnover of say 6,000 crore plus, that is equivalent, INR equivalent of 750 million. For them, this is there. Maybe in India, it may come after two, three years. But today, if it is the provision which has come in any part of the jurisdiction where your subsidiary is operating, you need to be mindful about it. So it is here with this little background. Let's get into the details of it. Now, I think this will remain, is it, that uh, we will not be able to see the complete screen. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it is better. It, it is. So, you know, pillar two, which has come in the form of a legislation in the sense that template legislation, which OECD has published, it has got this preamble and preamble tells us very many things. So what it says is that globe rules provide for a coordinated system of taxation to ensure that large MNE groups pay a minimum level of tax. So it is resonating what we talked about. But what is important here is coordinated system of taxation in the sense that here, whoever are the members of inclusive framework, they have agreed that either we will levy minimum tax and per chance, if we are not levying minimum tax, we will allow other countries to levy minimum tax. So that is a coordinated system of taxation. There is a minimum level of taxation which has to happen. And this minimum level of tax at present is agreed at 15 percentage. So 15 percentage is the minimum tax that has to happen. And what it is further telling is, is that this globy rules ensure that there is a minimum taxation by imposing a top up tax, that is by imposing and recovering tax, which is short of 15 percentage, determined on a jurisdictional basis. Now, what is the significance of this jurisdictional basis is again something we will understand, but preamble is making it very clear that we are going to have minimum tax of 15 percentage, if there is a shortfall in the sense that if there is zero tax, the shortfall is full 15 percentage. 
if there is minimum tax of 5 percentage or if dubai is going to introduce 9 percentage as the tax the shortfall is 6 percentage and we will recover it either dubai recovers it or dubai agrees that if dubai fails to recover it it will not object if other country wants to recover it and that is what the coordinated system of taxation is what are the policy objectives with which pillar 2 has come one of the things which we heard earlier also is to create a spike on race to bottom we want to end race to bottom there is an acknowledgement that 40 years back the average corporate tax rate was 40 percentage today the average corporate tax rate is 23 percentage so Policymakers felt that this race has to stop somewhere. Particularly when you have tax havens and their presence creates opportunities. They create a sort of inequality because India will have to compete with Cayman Island. India can't afford to have zero percentage tax rate. Cayman Island can afford to have it because they have very different agenda. So if India wants to compete with those which are zero tax country, it will not have level playing field. So acknowledging that there has to be a level playing field, that there has to be less attraction to go to tax havens and people will look at real substance, real infrastructure and go to those countries which are going to offer them real talent in terms of people or ability to have infrastructure. And the competition comes on a level playing field. So that's the first objective that they have. Second, of course, is that when you are able to raise resources, you have ability to spend for COVID related aspects for developing your infrastructure. And as a result of this, particularly these two twin objectives, they have indicated that we will introduce or allow a coordinated system by which minimum tax of 15 percentage is levied. Now, let's look at it and how it is going to happen. So it started somewhere two, three years back. BEPS 2 perhaps started about three years back. OECD came up with a blueprint and they presented it to the finance ministers of various nations. There was an agreement that yes, whatever OECD is thinking conceptually, that is providing taxing rights to market jurisdictions, that is pillar one, and allowing minimum taxation at 15 percentage. These two principles were enshrined in the blueprint. Countries felt convinced by those policies. They said, let's go ahead and agree with that. It was in July 21 that India released a press release and they said that we are fine with this policy. We are onboarding this inclusive framework and we want to be a part of this new architecture of taxation system whereby we are going to allow profit allocations to change and minimum tax related provisions to come in. The real power which was given to this particular commitment was October 21 statement. October 21 statement is a statement where 137 countries agreed that we are fine with this policy. So that is where the political commitment came in. OECD does not have teeth of its own. It is a political commitment which gives, empowers them to enable these policies to get implemented. So now in terms of that commitment, in December 21, OECD released the model rules. They released commentary in March 22. If OECD timeline is to be believed, by December 2022, these provisions should get implemented. These provisions are to be implemented pursuant to domestic legislation. Last year, everybody felt that Finance Bill of 2022 will introduce something about it. 
but we did not see any amendment in Indian domestic law. Today, India is still committing that, yes, we want to be a part of inclusive framework. But what India believes is that these rules are complex. OECD itself is struggling to clarify some of the nuanced aspects of the rules. OECD itself is going to make some tweaks. So when OECD finalizes this, we will open that rules for public deliberation and thereafter India will implement it. So if what we are hearing at public forums on behalf of government is any guide, India is presently in wait and watch mode. We do not have any hurry and very likely in 2023 also we may not see any amendments coming in. But as I said, since it's a coordinated system, it is not that if India were not to introduce this, it's not going to touch Indian headquartered companies or it is not going to touch the entities in India which are part of global ME group. So one needs to really read it. Second aspect, as uh, President-elect mentioned, there is a concept of subject to tax rule. Now that's a treaty-based concept and it is a suggestion or rather it is pushed by developing countries of inclusive framework that we want broader source rule to come in. Now broader source rule in the wake of treaties can come in only if it is pursuant to a modified treaties. They have seen success of MLI-1. So now what is suggested is that pursuant to MLI-2, there should be amendment to treaties and there should be wider source taxation granted to all the countries. India and other G24 countries, that is set of developing countries, they are insisting that uh, STTR should be given greater power, that there should be wider source rule, and the source rule should even extend to capital gains. STTR is not focus of our today's discussion, but if time permitting, we will touch about it because it is very important from India perspective. Now with this as little background, you know, when we will share these slides, you can look at it, whether pillar two is on track. As I said, India is in wait and watch mode. Are we going to see pillar two getting implemented from 22, that is starting from 1st January 23? Perhaps it was felt that yes, EU will go ahead and will implement it. In fact, EU came up with their draft directive also, which the countries can adopt in its domestic legislation. But there also the tussle is going on. One quarter is saying that, yes, we have to abide by 2022 timeline and start implementing it from 1st January 23. The other group is saying that, no, no, please wait, at least defer it by a year. So there is a discussion about deferral by a year. In US also, you see a complete divide. One group is saying that you need this fair system of taxation, it's going to create equilibrium. Everybody will be now at par, so there will be a level playing field. Other group is saying, have you gone mad? Have you realized that China will not introduce this? And if China doesn't introduce, what will happen to our US corporations? So there also you see a divide. UK, there is an advisory committee which tells UK, do you want to implement this fast or do you want to implement what is right? So the point is that even while Europe is discussing, many jurisdictions are discussing, there is a divide which is happening. So, you know, there is a sense that perhaps in October 21, when the commitment was made, perhaps that commitment was made without thinking through all pros and cons of it. Whatever it may be, we have this as coming. It's not that somebody is saying, just don't introduce. Very likely, you will see this happening in one or the other quarter of the world. And as we have seen, UAE is first example. 
Hong Kong, Singapore, Canada, Netherlands, Switzerland, all of them are reacting to it and they are indicating how they are going to be implementing or at least modifying their domestic tax architecture. Now, we know that, or rather we talked about these concepts and now I will add one more concept to it. So subject to tax rule is a treaty-based source to be widened. India and developing countries want that. That, if at all, will come by way of MLI 2. And that's under debate. And India wants that this should come and people are debating about it. Globe rules is made up of three parts. Income inclusion rule and under tax payment rules, those concepts we heard in the initial speech. But before that, there is another rule called domestic minimum tax rule. So we are going to see with one example, three concepts, domestic minimum tax, income inclusion rule, and under tax payment rule. I'm not elaborating on this concept as at present. We'll take one example and then talk about it. Now, before that, if you recollect the preamble, what it said is that this system, this new system is aiming to ensure minimum tax on a jurisdictional basis. Now, when you say on a jurisdictional basis, that means they are not aiming at either an entity level approach, neither they are aiming at global consolidated approach. Now, this is very important. Neither an entity approach nor a global approach. The new rules apply to ME group. ME group means those who have consolidated financial statements and where the annual turnover is more than say 6,000 or 6,400 crores if we go by CBCR uh, yardstick or the measurement uh, reference. CFS or the consolidated financial statement will have those entities which are consolidated on a line by line basis. That is where income, expenditure, revenue, profits, losses, and cash flow. They are completely consolidated on a line by line basis. Only those entities are part of it. Now, let's say we have Indian parent and let's say it has presence in UAE, Dubai. And for a minute, presume that Dubai is either not implementing their domestic tax law or the entities with which we are concerned, they are still not subjected to tax in UAE. And that is possible because those entities which are in free trade zone of Dubai, they may not trigger any tax. Now, when we are talking about jurisdictional blending, just consider this example here. So you have Indian parent, three subsidiaries in Dubai. First subsidiary has profit of 5,200. Second subsidiary has loss of 4,000. And third subsidiary has profit of 3,000. So now if we aggregate these three results, that is 5,200 plus 3,000 minus 4,000, we find that at an aggregate level, there is profit of 4,200. This is what jurisdictional blending will mean, that you are aggregating results of all the entities which are there in that jurisdiction. Now ask a question, what is the tax which this entity is paying in Dubai? Answer is that it is zero percentage. Though there is tax in Dubai, so far as these entities are concerned, they are in free trade zone. They are not paying any tax. What is the shortfall you have as a result of it? If you say that floor is 15 percentage, so shortfall is straight 15 percentage, right? Now, what OECD has suggested or what the Globy rule says is that we will apply this shortfall rate to the profits, which is excess profits. Let's understand what is meant by excess profits and what is the logic behind finding out excess profits. So excess profits is profits 
as aggregated for that jurisdiction minus substance based carve out substance based carve out means normatively calculated returns on your tangible assets and on your payroll cost what oecd is saying that if you have real substance in the form of assets or in the form of employees in dubai then at certain percentage and that percentage today being 8 to 10 percentage after 10 years it will be 5 percentage so at certain percentage on a normative basis you determine what is the routine profit so oecd believes that if you have invested in tangible assets or if you have employed people in that very jurisdiction where you are not paying tax we will allow you that your presence is for real purpose to some extent so let's say that in this case the presence related carve out is 200 so 4200 is the aggregate profit then you have exclusion of substance of 200 so excess profit comes to 4000 now on this 4000 you are going to pay tax at the rate of 15 percentage so in this case the shortfall works out to 15 percentage of 4000 that is 600 okay so what are the messages we got from here one you are looking at jurisdictional blending you are not looking at individual entities you are looking at jurisdictional blending that means you are not going to look at what is happening in jurisdiction outside of ua it is possible that this parent has presence in brazil malaysia and other countries where there might be huge taxes paid but you are not looking at global bank you are not even looking at only sub 1 and sub three on an individual basis you are looking at sub 1 sub 2 sub 3 on an aggregate jurisdictional blending basis and another important thing is that you are not leaving top up tax on entire globe income you are leaving top up tax on excess income so theoretical assuming here in this example the substance was huge and a substance related exclusion was 5000 rupees then there would not have been any shortfall so in real life we have seen indian mnes who have present say in jurisdiction like malaysia and the substance is so real there and the profits that you calculate on substance are so much that they really exhaust whatever might be the tax incentivized income there and they do not pay any tax there so with this as an uh, introduction let's just tell ourselves where pillar 2 is not likely to be relevant so we saw an example where pillar 2 quantified tax liability at 600 but let's just see where pillar 2 is not likely to be relevant one is that if you are not large mn that means if your turnover is less than 6 6400 crore you do not need to worry second is they have kept as at present all individuals outside of globe rules so say for example mr mayur nayak has empire and he has empire where he is holding controlling interest in four laterals each lateral has turnover of 2000 crores had there been a parent above these four laterals the turnover would have crossed 6400 it would have been in globe rules but because they have kept individuals natural persons outside the globe rules an individual who is holding parallel empire they will not come within this globe rules as i already told you that if you are earning moderate profits and if you have enough substance the question of excess income will not come you will not trigger globe there this aspect is very very important globe and uh, just uh, because globe can also be understood as our mother earth 
just to distinguish it, there is this pronunciation that you call it globi, but otherwise it is globe or globi, it is more a colloquial reference. What is important from globi perspective is that it is targeting corporate profits. It will not apply to what may be called a derivative income and a derivative income being dividend or capital gains. Dividend is paid from your corporate profits. If your corporate profits are already subjected to minimum tax, there is no further taxation on dividend income. Secondly, capital gains on sale of shares. The logic is that when do you pay capital gains on sale of shares? Either because underlying company has profits or underlying company has potential to make profits. Now, if it has profits, the profits are already subjected to minimum tax. If it has potential to make profits, as in when the potential fructifies, there will be minimum tax. So remember this important thing that dividend income or capital gains income, they will not be subjected to minimum tax pursuant to Globi because they are considered to be derivative income rather than corporate profits. Here, most transactions, that is whether you have interest in subsidiary, joint venture, associate, or any entity where your interest exceeds 10 percentage, you are home, you do not pay any tax on dividend income, neither you pay tax on capital gains income. But if you are a portfolio shareholder, and portfolio shareholder here, they have taken the threshold of 10 percentage. So if you are a shareholder of less than 10 percentage, capital gain and dividend on it, if it is held for less than one year for dividend, will be subjected to Globi. Now this is an objective yardstick. Portfolio, less than 10 percentage is portfolio. Facebook and Google, they have 9 percentage stake in Geo. Nobody will say that it is portfolio. It is a strategic investment made. But from Globi perspective, this will be treated as portfolio. Again, from India perspective, Supposing all those Dubai entities which we talked about just a minute before in that example are alleged to be poem resident of India. Now, if they become poem resident of India, they will be deemed to be located not in Dubai, but in India. Any which ways, once they are poem resident, they will suffer full taxation. Question of they being low tax constituent entity will not arise. There are further exclusions, but because we have very many other important things to uh, cover, we will skip that. So we talked about where pillar is not going to be relevant. Now let's talk about where it is going to be relevant. And this is important. So we have lady from Tata Steel. For them, pillar two is going to be really, really relevant because there turnover is going to be 6,400 crore. So any meaningful Indian headquartered group which has 6,400 of crore coming in their consolidated financial statement, they are within the group. It is possible that ETR of Tata Steel is much more than 15% at CFS level. And that can happen because of global blending. Is this a safe harbor for Tata still? Answer is clear, no. Because as I said, what you're going to look at is a jurisdictional calculation. The fact that you may pay much higher than 15% tax rate in some other jurisdiction is not going to be of any help to you. Are you targeting only Cayman, British Virgin Island, Barbados, or Bermuda, or some such tax havens? Answer is no. Tax may not be paid in any jurisdiction for any reason. There could be very well-meaning incentives in those jurisdictions. 
you want to give green credits because you want your country to be fit for 55? This incentive is very well meaning because today ESG is very important. Does it mean that it is protected? No. India wants to give 80 JJAA because India wants to encourage employment. Is it protected? Answer is no. India was giving or rather there are entities in India which are continuing to enjoy 80 IA benefit. Does it mean that that benefit will be scooped away? Answer is yes. Irrespective of the policy decision, you have an entity like Serum, COVID innovations, you want to encourage them, give them some incentive. Will you be able to give? Answer is no. So whatever may be the reason for incentive, howsoever meaningful, important they may be, all those incentives are of no relevance. If you are not having effective tax of 15 percentage paid in that jurisdiction, one or the other jurisdiction will scoop it away. Now, we talked about significance of jurisdictional blending and impact of jurisdictional blending. And I just mentioned that whether Tata still having more than 15 percentage ETR at CFS level makes Tata still a safe entity. So leaving aside Tata still, let's just contextualize with numbers. And this is something we have seen in real life. This is a likely impact which we have seen in real life. So say you have Indian entity, which is a parent entity. You have subsidiary in Malaysia. It is paying tax at 20 percentage. In India itself, the entity is paying tax at 30 percentage. There is jurisdiction like say Brazil, there is loss of 5,000. And our favorite Dubai, where there is a profit of 4,000 and shortfall of 600. Now, if you see before Globe, what was the position? So you have in India, taxes paid of 300. In Malaysia, you have taxes paid of 400. Brazil, you have losses, you have not paid taxes. Your aggregate tax that you have paid is 700. And because you have losses in Brazil, which are so huge that your profit before tax at consolidated level is 2000. What is the effective tax rate you have here? Whooping 35%. You're already on a global basis, a group which has got 35% of the tax rate. Globe comes in. 600 is the additional tax which is arising on account of globe. Just to recollect on 4,000, we quantified in earlier slide that tax is 600. So now what happens to your ETR? And if you know you are looking at a listed company, you are a, on the board of this listed company, you are a part of taxation committee, you can understand the impact that it can have. Of course, I have taken numbers which are highly skewed, but is this something realistic? Answer is yes. And when such things happen, so when you have Indian entities present in jurisdiction like uh, Mauritius, Dubai, or even present in jurisdiction which are giving you well-meaning incentive and you have earned profits which are more than what OECD believes are routine or a reasonable profits. So with this, let's come to that 600 as our example. India as the parent, Malaysia, Brazil, and Dubai as our countries. 600 is the shortfall that you have here, okay? Now here comes how the coordinated rules work. How as part of this inclusive framework, you are going to play musical chair. If not this, this, if not this, that, okay? So how it happens? So first, the first priority is to Dubai itself. Wake up dear, you can recover 600. 
So Dubai can introduce what is called domestic minimum tax. This is different from corporate tax that Dubai will introduce. Domestic minimum tax has to have architecture design which is akin to what Globi says. Then only it becomes a domestic minimum tax. So first Dubai can recover and Dubai can say, okay, if I'm not going to recover, any which ways India will recover by way of income inclusion rule. Income inclusion rule, sort of, it is nothing but a different form of CFC, Control Foreign Corporation Regulation. So parent scoops away what could have been the tax liability in respect of its baby that is subsidiary. Okay, for some reason, some theoretical reason, neither Dubai steps in nor India steps in. Sounds unrealistic, but let's assume hypothetically that that is what is happening. Then the third rule is that the subsidiaries which have substance and which are implementing Globi rules can recover the tax. So theoretically, if Dubai doesn't recover as first priority, India doesn't recover as the second priority, then the other jurisdictions which are having substance, they can recover it. So theoretically, if jurisdiction that is Malaysia and Brazil, they have certain employees, then in the ratio of the number of employees, Brazil and Malaysia will be able to recover this 600 of tax. Okay, assuming the substance as defined in the Globi rules is equal, then 300 will be recovered by Brazil and 300 will be recovered by Malaysia. So this is how the coordinated system works. Now here I have tried to just reinforce some of the principles which we just understood. We are clear that minimum tax is going to be there irrespective of the policy reasons, whether or not you are in tax heaven, but that tax has to be with regard to the excess profit, excess being something over and above the normative substance exclusion. So let's say, again, we are talking about Indian headquartered group, and these are theoretical examples more to indicate how in different circumstances you can have top-up tax and where you may not have top-up tax. So let's say there is Netherlands subsidiaries, which this entity has. Netherlands subsidiary is having gross income of 1,000. But that income is itself subjected to source taxation of say 10% in the jurisdiction from where the income was sourced. So on 1000, tax of 100 is already paid. Source taxation is on gross basis. Globi taxation is with reference to your profits. So assuming that this Netherlands entity has book profit of 600, the percentage will be calculated not on gross basis, but it will be calculated with reference to net profit. So on 600, there is a tax of 100, which is above 15 percentage. And therefore, this Netherlands subsidiary is in a wide zone. Likewise, Malaysia. Let's say Malaysia is offering investment linked incentive deduction akin to what we have in 35 AD, accelerated depreciation. Now, whenever you have accelerated depreciation, in the books, you will have deferred tax liability recognized. So this is very important from Globi perspective. When it calculates what is the tax that you have paid, it not only takes into account what is the current tax, but it also takes into account, uh, takes into account what is the deferred tax. So once you have deferred tax, which is reckoned in it, if you are in a high tax jurisdiction, with the help of deferred tax, you will be able to ensure that there is 15% tax which is recovered from you. 
here it may be noted that if you want to study globi and if you have left behind your study tax defer tax defer liability accounting principles you will have to go and open your india's book ifrs books and refresh everything on those accounting concepts it is built around accounting concepts and as a result of it it is defer tax liability which will save you so whenever you have incentives which doesn't give you super deduction so 352 ab was a super deduction if 352 ab would have continued we would have had difficulty here but if you have incentives which are just accelerated and which can get countermatched by dtl and if you are in a jurisdiction which is more than 15 percentage tax rate you will not have difficulty third is a situation of india having pe in bangladesh now all of us know that pe in bangladesh our treaty operates under exemption method so india will not be able to assert right of taxation till now we have taken all examples where the presence was in the form of a subsidiary but globi extends even to presence which is in the form of pe so what will happen is that pe will be treated as a person in bangladesh calculation will happen at bangladesh now assume for a minute that bangladesh is giving complete incentive to that branch is not recovering any tax from it and assuming there is excess income there will be top up tax india will want to assert the right but the treaty will come in its way treaty will say that india has to give exemption so the commentary acknowledges and blueprint also had acknowledged that there has to be a switch over route that is there has to be an amendment to the treaty to permit this taxation this is very simple if you have subsidiary in cayman zero tax top up tax is inevitable and it is to be paid you have a subsidiary in mauritius mauritius will tell you tax rate is 15 percentage standard deduction 12 percentage 3 percentage effective rate they go by effective rate so 12 percentage is the shortfall you have a subsidiary in france again more than 15 percentage tax rate but france operates on territorial taxation system doesn't tax overseas income you will have in your profit and loss account no taxation qua the overseas income etr will fall below 15 percentage and there will be a pick up on account of that so while france gives territorial taxation exemption india will be able to assert right and will be able to recover with regard to that now having said that the compliance burden is amazing you know even if you do not have any tax liability so say there is indian group having strong presence in malaysia with strong substance fully clear that substance is so much or brazil is having losses but still the compliances will have to be done so what netflix ceo had to say that we have to hire an army of accountants just to guarantee that there will be consistency in compliance so compliance burden is going to be huge whether or not you trigger any top up tax is not so much relevant it's like you know in india i have to file return of income even if i have incurred losses so that way this compliance will have to be there now this is something very important do we feel that those entities which are in india they are safe in the sense that india itself has reputation of being a high tax jurisdiction it levies tax in one way or the other does one feel that if any entity is operating in india they will not have to bother about globi at all so if microsoft has so many subsidiaries in india 
can microsoft say that okay i don't have to worry about any top up tax so far as india is concerned i am already paying sufficient tax in india if there is hyundai say implementing some infra projects in india can they say that oh we are already paying mat which is more than 15% so we don't have to worry can they say that to some extent yes they are right india does not have meaningful incentives today not weighted deduction no super deduction we already have mat and amt even our concessional tax regime is above 15% in fact we have so many disallowance provisions that you will only have those disallowances increasing your etr 35 ad deduction is just an accelerated deduction and as we just saw it is likely to get countermatch with the help of dta dtl you have if there are past losses you can take benefit of those past losses through the mechanism of dta again to remind ourselves we'll have to learn accounting standards and be clear how that dta dtl takes place so these are the factors which says that yes it may be safe for someone to say that indian entities are not likely to have any top up tax liability we have very nominal incentives where there could be super deduction so atjj aa is one example pattern box regime you have tax of 10 percentage but that is on gross basis so maybe in some circumstances there the etr might fall below 15 percentage if you do not have regular expenses but where the impact can arise is possibly those companies which have agricultural income say tata they have agricultural income they have standard deduction of 16% so even if they pay tax at 25% their standard deduction will be 15% their etr might come to 10% but then you are not just looking at tata t you are looking at tata t and all the subsidiaries of tata t which are in india because you are looking at jurisdictional blending so that way if the foreign company has presence in india which is say in the form of pe which is say in the form of 17 percentage company or which is say in the form of 25 percentage company that pe tax of 40 percentage will also be taken into account while determining the jurisdictional blending having said that one gets a sense that okay fairly india is a safe jurisdiction we are not likely to have scenarios of any top up tax so let's just chill answer is no if you all recollect those days when we were struggling with mat and you know client comes to you and says i am not enjoying any deduction i am not even paying huge dividend why do i worry about mat and our answer would be devil is in details that the provisions are such that you might still need to worry about mat liability even if you feel that at the policy level mat is not applicable to you that exactly may happen and while i have taken three four examples i'll just illustrate in detail with one example as to how interplay between our domestic law and globi rules can trigger top up tax liability even when you feel that india's tax rate is more than 15% so let's consider a situation where you have indian company it say started infra activity before march 17 it is today enjoying atia 100% tax deduction but mat is applicable to it so 1000 of profit 17% tax it would be more than 15% one would not worry about it but here you have a spike for a given year it has transferred one of the subsidiary shares and to recollect for globi we are only on operating profits whatever are the derivative profits dividend capital gains other than portfolio you have to ignore 
you not only ignore income but you also ignore loss okay so for met per, uh, purposes you are having income of 400 because it is real loss it is not impairment provision so for your met you are making provision of 68 that is 17 percentage of 400 you might feel that met credit is available and you might recognize met credit also if this loss on sale of shares is available to you for set off in future you might even recognize dta with regard to that loss but when it comes to globi what happens you have operating profit of 1000 you don't consider this loss so globi income is 1000 your tax is only 68 okay if this met credit is reducing your tax which is an ambiguous area it will become zero but let's not get into that ambiguity let's presume that tax is 68 like how you ignore loss of 600 you even ignore dta which relates to shares so you ignore it so you come to a situation where despite applicability of headline rate of 17 percentage you are getting an answer that your effective tax rate is just 6.8 percentage there is a shortfall of 8.2 percentage that you need to look at the message here is that devil is in details when you will look at the real life situation and when you get into the actual implementation and calculation india may also not necessarily appear as a safe harbor to you as i said while the slide has some more examples of how those mismatches can come we will in the interest of time take another important aspect and may i just ask how many minutes we have okay okay so that we'll uh, i'll wind up in next 10 minutes or so and we'll take up question answers thereafter so this is also very important concept and again a reminder that while the rules may be little away from indian shore there might be a need to start looking at the provisions and undertake impact analysis and see if you are not able to avoid tax top up tax because that's a global commitment now and maybe that is minimum tax that you will have to pay you at least avoid inefficiencies and you at least undertake those restructures which will remove those inefficiencies so with that this next two examples are something that we have to look at let's say we have mauritius company and for the time being let's not get into that 3 percentage let's say there is complete exemption and mauritius entities could enjoy complete exemptions because they also have some export related incentives let's say profit is 1000 now when this profit of 1000 is distributed to india india receives dividend income india will pay tax in respect of dividend income and now 115 bbd is gone tax rate is 34% so on 1000 assuming atm deduction is not claimed ico will pay tax of 340 okay globi rules have the provisions whereby they reallocate tax of one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction so the logic and the rational here is that tax has to go to the stream to which it relates okay so in the example which we had seen about netherlands withholding was attributed to netherlands entity because it was income of netherlands the fact that the tax was paid say somewhere in uh, belgium would not matter because it was tax on that income again the principle here is that 
dividend is application of operating profit so whatever is the tax on dividend that also will get reallocated to operating profits so what will happen if india pays tax of 3000 uh, 340 in our example that tax will get allocated to mauco so 340 over 1000 no further iir is needed okay but let's just tweak the fact mauco pays dividend 1 ico in turn pays dividend 2 to individual shareholders atm deduction is claimed then there will be no reallocation individuals will pay their own taxation that will not get reallocated because individuals as i said mayur bhai is outside of globi so individual related tax does not get reallocated ico though it enjoys atm deduction will in this particular stream this group will trigger additional tax liability of 150 either mauritius will recover it by way of domestic minimum tax or india will recover it by way of iir but there will be inefficiency to that extent now this inefficiency gets further compounded when you look at the layer structure so you have let's say an operating entity once again if you want to keep mauritius let's say there is mauritius entity no sorry we need layer structure so this entity has to be say in malaysia so malaysian entity earns income of 1000 and let's say it enjoys complete exemption so as a result of it there is no tax which malaysian entity pays when malaysia will declare dividend to mauritius Mauritius, because of its domestic law, they will say we don't want to tax this dividend income. Let's not tax it. But when Mauritius will pay to India, India will say yes, yes, we want to tax, and on this one thousand tax will be three forty rupees. Okay. What did we just see? There is reallocation. So reallocation. india will reallocate to mauritius because dividend came from mauritius what happens in mauritius when you compute globi income of mauritius what it has received only dividend dividend is a derivative income derivative income means not subjected to glob so what is mauritius globi income nil what is tax it has 340 is reallocated does it help any purpose answer is no can the group say no no we don't want to reallocate to mauritius let's reallocate to malaysia because look we have shortfall there globi rule says no the reallocation is only to the entity which has paid dividend to so you could allocate india's tax to mauritius if mauritius levy tax it could have been reallocated to malaysia but india's tax cannot be reallocated to uh, uh, malaysia point is these are the devils which are lying finely ingredient in details very complex you need to struggle to understand believe me if you read globi rules without reference to commentary and if you understand it i i would salute you after commentary yes you might feel what is the logic with which the provisions are worded very smartly drafted and drafted with a clear intent that people will try and find loophole to get out of it so you want to close each possible loophole so you try and work layers and layers and layers on it the language becomes highly complex again you know it is vasudev kutumbakam one size fit all now if we struggle 
in the past to understand Indian income tax. And if we have found difficult to understand what US taxation system is or UK taxation system is, this is one template which is going to run across the jurisdiction. So complex, I really agree with what Netflix policy, tax policy advisor say that you need army of people to even understand and implement it. So here, the idea was to simplify, demystify that if India is high-tech jurisdiction or for that matter, any country is high-tech jurisdiction, don't feel that you are not going to have top-up tax. Very likely there is top-up tax. And of course, the jurisdictions like Mauritius, Dubai, Cayman Island, it's very easy because there you don't even have substance-based uh, exclusion and you do trigger tax liability. With this, I will very briefly talk about, uh, talk about subject to tax rule, that is treaty-based rule. We are till now used to a situation where we look at our domestic law. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so I have a very attentive audience here. So it's looking like, you know, really reminded of uh, tuition classes that I used to conduct when I was in college. So we used to have very small group of people coming in. So sorry, uh, folks who are uh, miles away from me. Uh, so what I was saying was subject to tax rule, a treaty-based rule. Of course, we need to wait for how the architecture will come, what they will write. But basis blueprint, what it is saying is, and I'm just explaining it with the help of three, four examples here. So till now, we look at domestic law. 115A, 11 percentage rate. Treaty rate is 10 percentage, 5 percentage, 7.5 percentage. We take whichever of the two is beneficial and we go. If we want to give benefit of treaty, we might look at the conditions like LOB, PPT, subject to tax, but net net, the tax rate is as provided in the treaty. Now, when developing countries are asking for expanded source rule and 9 percentage of the tax rate, what is the compromise which is suggested, at least in blueprint, is that, okay, you need 9 percentage. It should be 9 percentage in your country and country of residence put together. So if you are making payment to Dubai entity and Dubai successfully introduces 9 percentage, Today, India does not have source taxation, so zero. Dubai will have nine percentage. Zero plus nine, are you achieving nine? Bye-bye. You, you don't get source taxation right. So for the first time, you're going to ask a question. What is the headline rate of tax which is happening in the country of residence? So in this example, suppose if the payment is made to Mauritius and let's say India source taxation is zero, Mauritius tax rate is 3% with whatever examples that we are aware. Then STTR will apply in India at 6%. Okay. That is provided India already does not have taxation right. If it is interest which is paid to Mauritius entity, and if India already has 7.5 percentage right, then it will be 7.5 percentage right that will happen. So the point is, we'll have a new MLI which will introduce source taxation in a very different manner. It was expected that STTR related framework would have come by mid. Uh, March 2022. We are already in May 2022. Since STTR is very significant, had STTR really come, I would not have spoken about Globi at all. 
my focus would have been on STTR, but nonetheless, we have to wait and watch. We have some questions, so how do I do that? Uh, uh, and of course, if there are any questions here from the audience, we can. So thank you very much. I uh, hope uh, it was uh, clear. The subject is complex, but uh, I did try my best to simplify to the extent possible. Thank you very much. I I'll pick up the questions. Yeah, and I'll just read out the questions and uh... Mirva, if the mic can be switched on there as well. Yeah, sorry. Check. Uh, there are some people who have raised hands. Whether yes, they are yes. Common or there are I'm just checking those questions and then, them. yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, uh, Mr. Bhautik Shah has asked that uh, how does interplay between transopraising and Globi rules looks like? It is very unlikely that there would be substantial apportionment under Globi. And the second is that any clarity on UTPR versus IIR, IIR, how would the subsidiary company jurisdiction recover or how to ensure that there is no double taxation? <laughs> yeah. Okay, please. So, uh, it looks we have audience which has read and is bothered about it. So, TP and Globi rules will interact. In fact, the whole mechanism is built on the premise that the books are reflecting ALP profits or ALP expenditure. So ALP is still protected. In fact, one of the items that you would note in this uh, slide pack is that Globi is over and above whatever SARS that you have today. So whether POEM, whether PPT, whether transfer pricing, whether 94B, everything will survive. And Globi itself has provision which says that the transactions have to be at arm's length price. If not at arm's length price, they are contemplating how to make adjustments. And the understanding which OECD has provided on that aspect is such that the adjustment should be so made that at least global tax is not avoided. What may happen to domestic law is not OECD's concern. But the commentary is so explaining that provision that there should not be reduction in globi. So like how our section 92 subsection 3 works on single track basis, the provision in the globi rules is benign. It is permitting two-way traffic that you can make adjustment upwards also, downwards also. But the commentary gives illustrations and explanations by which it becomes a single track adjustment. Okay. And, and not how it affects your domestic tax, but how it affects the globi tax. On UTPR versus IIER, Bhautik, if your question is whether UTPR is a real backstop, whether it can become larger than IIER, answer perhaps is yes. Which jurisdiction will recover is pursuant to that hierarchy which is there, domestic minimum tax, IIR, and if not that, then UTPR comes in. I hope I have answered your question that it will have to be as per hierarchy. Nobody has an option. How tax of Dubai residual profits would be distributed among other jurisdiction of group operating, say India, Brazil, Malaysia, Will it entire tax would be paid to India? So, Umang, uh, just to go back to our example, with 600 of top up tax, the first priority was with Dubai. If Dubai did not recover, it was with India, IIR. If India also did not recover it, it went to those jurisdictions which implemented Globi and which has substance. So, that's a formula there. And that substance, in our example, we assume that let's say Malaysia and Brazil both have equal substance, then 300, 300 will go to them. Is there any concept of globe tax credit in subsequent year? No, it is not. Or 
once it is paid it is additional cost forever yes so in the example that we had that indian headquartered company where the tax rate sort of from 35 percentage to 65 percentage it is a permanent sunk cost i i there are 12 questions okay okay mm -hmm. Uh, STTR applies to which payments? So we wait for exec treaty tax to come in. But when these slides are circulated to you all, we have listed. So India wants, India or rather all developing countries want that list to be as expansive as possible. They want even dividend to get covered. Otherwise, the basic framework was to cover only base eroding payments. But India wants even dividends to get covered. India wants even capital gains to get covered. So that is what they are asking for. So, but of course it depends on treaty as it will come, MRI 2, when it gets implemented, who agrees to it. And as I'm hearing, even UN wants to come up with a template on STTR. So there would be some interplay there as well. Are you going to share PPT? No. Of course, yes. <laughs> uh, my question is, if in India, say, company is covered under ATIA and say it is paying MAT, MAT credit would be eligible. Then on a jurisdictional blending basis, if MAT credit would be eligible, then should GLOBE needs to be applied. Now, there is one very curious animal sitting in globi called qualified tax refund system and non-qualified tax refund system we are struggling very likely uh, met credit will not answer to that requirement because met credit is not refunded our tilt is that met credit will wipe off your tax. But we have not concluded on that. And that was the reason I left that as a question mark. But you are right, Monica, there could be a risk if it is considered to be wiping off my present current tax. Can the GLOBE ETR be revised post-assessment? So these are related to, okay, no, this question is important. Uh, can you, <clears throat> Revise ETR. So you file tax return in Malaysia. You say that you do not have tax. Then you have huge additions made. What happens? So Globy doesn't go by relation back to the year to which tax relates. It goes by the point of time you go out of your pocket and when you incur the liability. So it will not relate back. It will be considered to be tax of the year in which that uh, liability triggers. Shall we get the presentation? Rest are not. Whether equalization levy will be done away with pillar one and two, of course, it has no interaction with pillar two. Pillar one, of course, if what we have to believe as the statement, uh, the commitment that we have, perhaps it has to go. But that's, again, something that we are not talking about today. Any question from this audience? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gita Ben. You will all agree that there cannot be more awesome simplification of such complex laws than what we have just witnessed and heard. Gita Ben, I am reminded of a conversation I had with one friend who's very spiritual, and he had said that you have two choices to get a wisdom. One is you read all the scriptures and you will spend your lifetime. The other option is read Gita and how truly you live by your name. 
if you want to have a wisdom on globi then you know where to go whom to consult thank you so much and this has been a remarkable enlightening of our minds and orientation of things which are in offing which could be coming maybe in short time and before we wind up i would request gautam bhai to present a memento which is a momentous memento if i may say as a practice of bcs to geeta ben it's a picture of memento given to geeta ben by our chairman uh, mayur nayak and this is being presented to her this is for on the online uh, viewers and now may i request before we wind up mahesh nayak to give the vote of thanks a truly deserving vote of thanks thank you thank you thank you meer bhai uh, i am sure all of us would agree that this has been an enriching session uh friends before we get to the pleasant task of vote of thanks uh, there are a few announcements about forthcoming events of bcas uh the ta taxation committee has organized a hybrid seminar on taxation of virtual digital asset uh, popularly known as the cryptocurrency on the 6th of may uh the taxation committee jointly with six other organizations has organized the direct tax home refresher course uh, uh, the third for the third year um uh, that's going to be on the 19th 24 26th 31st of may and the 2nd of june uh the accounting and auditing committee uh, has the, organized the 11th residential study course on nds from the 24th to the 26th of june 2022 uh we have uh, the 9th yrrc organized by the corporate and commercial law committee on the 21st of may the human resource development committee has organized the power summit 2022 thriving in a transformed hybrid world where there on 28th of may where there will be a workshop the internal audit committee has organized the forensic accounting and investigation studies course uh, from the 1st of april uh, to 8th of may the taxation committee jointly with three other organizations uh, has organized a seminar on tds and tcs provisions a 360 degree perspective on the 20th of may uh, the international tax committee uh, has organized a small uh, program uh, uh, for the release of its upcoming uh, transfer pricing compendium on the 23rd of may uh, uh, between 5:30 and 7:30 uh announcements for all these uh events uh would have been shared with you and with some of them would be uh shared uh with you shortly please do register uh for these events now on to the pleasant task of the vote of thanks uh friends i think all of us would agree that uh, uh geeta ma'am has simplified the complex rules which run into hundreds of pages and has covered various nuances by giving these practical examples and which would definitely help all of us from a practitioner's perspective i am sure all of us would agree that this has been an enriching session and definitely acts as something that we would def, uh, would uh, uh, on a topic which is going to be uh, the future and which is going to impact a lot of us in our practice uh, on that note i would request everyone to kindly uh, give uh, geeta ma'am uh, a well deserved uh, vote of thanks <laughs>